Hello, Comics Alternative fans. Before we start with the episode, we want to invite all of you to check out our Patreon campaign. That's right. Go to www.patreon.com slash comics alternative for more details. There you'll find more information about the campaign and the cool rewards levels we have. For as little as $1 a month, you can help us maintain good quality comics talk. And the more you contribute, the more perks you get. These include monthly podcast episodes exclusive to Patreon supporters, as well as the chance to help us choose which books we review on the show. So be sure to visit www.patreon.com slash comics alternative and become one of our proud podcast patrons. Yeah, and now on with the show. This is the Comics Alternative, episode 142, a look at the July previews catalog. Ladies and gentlemen, do not be alarmed. Please remain perfectly still. What you are about to see is real. The performers are not grinning scarecrows sent here to torture and manipulate you. Welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, we're going to be looking through the July previews catalog. But before we discuss the contents of that, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, and they'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you'll find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. All of the other publishers, you'll see that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes you'll find the specials at 45% off cover price. Sometimes at 50% off the cover price. But many times, you'll find discounts that are more impressive than that. That's right, and... Uh, as usual, they'll have a load of bundles up for July where you can take advantage of deeper discounts on multiple comics than you would get if you were uh, buying those comics individually. But in addition to that, one of the things that uh, we wanted to announce is that DCBS is going to be offering some exclusive covers, variant covers for image trade paperbacks and collections Uh, some of these are available now and available for upcoming releases very soon so the first one that they have available which is out now is the uh, Witches Volume 1 trade paperback with an exclusive variant cover just for DCB service users and then uh, in the uh, coming months two more exclusives, one for Bitch Planet Volume 1 and one for the East of West hard Volume 1 hardcover collection. So you can check those out, and there's definitely more of these to come. So these... Um, this is a new a new deal basically for DCBS to be offering the, these special variants and you can only get them through DCB service. That's right. And it's one of the many reasons why you should be getting your comics at Discount Comic Book Service for specials such as this and discounts that cannot be beaten. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do pre-order your comics there, drop them a line and tell them that Derek and Andy, the two guys with PhDs, sent you. That's right. So, Andy, welcome back. Uh, how was your sabbatical? Uh, it was good. I got a lot of I got a lot of work done. I got some uh, a ton of research done. Did did a lot of of writing in that time. And you know we're recording this on Sunday, and um, and so today is also my last day of basically of summer break uh, because next week I start up as um, my new job is the chair of the of the de- department that I work in. 
at, at my school. And so basically, this is the end of my summer vacation for the next four years, or at least <laughs> since my, my term as chair is a, a four-year term. I'm, ne- I'm not getting another summer vacation ever again. Well, you know what they say, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, yeah. I'll, well, I'm looking forward to that <laughs> exercise of power. Mainly what I have to do this week is move my office. So um, I'm not getting a bigger office, which is unfortunate, but I am getting a nicer office. Okay. Do, do you get one or two minions at least? No, that's the thing, too. It just at the end of this week, the administrative assistant for our department retires, and there's no oh. plan on replacing her. So I don't even have I don't even have an administrative assistant. I don't even have somebody who I can say, uh, you know, tell them I'm not Make in. This copy. <laughs> no, tell them I'm not in. Uh, you know, buy a buy an anniversary present for my wife. I don't know. All the while, I have a, I have a kind of madman. I have a madman fantasy of having an administrative assistant. Oh. Fill up my liquor cabinet. Can't do that. By the way, did where are my ci- did you, where are did my you, cigarettes? <laughs> what? Did you did you see the series finale of Mad Men? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I've thought yeah, about oh, that a lot. Yeah, I, I keep I keep not only that, and the, the, I don't know if this is really a spoiler. I I have not <laughs> stopped singing that damn Coke song in my head since that episode, and it's been a while since yeah. that episode aired. Yeah, it's been almost two months now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So um, no, it's been a good time. I, I spent a week at Ohio State University at the uh, Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum researching uh, underground comics and s- some other stuff there. And that you know that is just an amazing place. I'm so glad that our our field has such a, a kind of mecca mm-hmm. for uh, for comic studies. And um, I got to work with some great people while I was there. And plus, I got to uh, hang out with, uh, for a little bit, got to hang out with Tom Spurgeon and with uh, Caitlin McGurk. Caitlin works at the library, and Tom recently moved to Columbus. So um, that was a good time. Oh, great. And uh, I know, you know, for those who listen to the podcast, you, you were gone for most of the past two months. But every now and again, you popped on to do an interview here or there. So so that was good. And, you know, I want to thank Andy Wolverton for stepping in for those two months when you were gone, because uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely can't do this by myself. And he gladly filled in, although I think... Um, it didn't earn me many points with uh, Andy's wife. Well, there you go. The 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 uh, you know the the pri- that's the price we pay for having a moderately successful comic podcast. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I would also like to thank Andy, and you know, getting to meet Andy too at HeroesCon recently was great. But you know, Andy stepping in to help out while I was I was taking a needed break was uh, really really helpful yeah yeah it, it was and you know but it's good to have you back and we're gonna start by talking about the july previews catalog but andy before we get to the solicits in this month's catalog mm-hmm. uh we should share some listener mail that we've received over the past week yeah let's do that mail time. Mail time. Ooh, mail time. the mail's here mail time. that means we get to see our old friend mailbox uh, early in the week, this is after last week's review show, uh, and in last week's review show, one of the titles we discussed was Little Nemo Return to Slumberland. Uh, one of our listeners, who's also someone who comes to the on-location shows I do every month at my local shop at Collected, uh, Matthew Cusio, he wrote to say that he thought we may have had our information a little mixed up in terms of why the character of Jimmy in Little Nemo Return to Slumberland has the middle name of Nemo. I think I had said, if I remember correctly, that his father and mother named named him Nemo with his middle name because they were fans of the original Little Nemo comic. And Matthew wrote us to say, I don't think that's the case. I think he's actually related to the original 
Little Nemo. But then I looked it up, and actually, Jimmy, he has a middle name of Nemo because of the movie Finding Nemo. Huh. There you go. So, yes. Uh, and even though Aunt Matthew – and Matthew said in his posting on Facebook he wasn't exactly sure of the details, but he thought we may be a little off. And he was right. We were off. But, uh, see, this is the kind of thing I really appreciate. When, when we're wrong about something and a listener will write in to say, hey, I think you may have your facts mixed up, you're a little off base, as long as they're not nasty about it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, Matthew, thank you for listening, and thank you for uh, commenting on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And we had another Facebook comment just the other day from Tristan Laurie, and he said, Hey, sirs of comics non-spandex clad, just wanted to extend my thanks for always putting out quality entertainment slash information slash madness. Here's to the Comics Alternative podcast existing forever and then some. Well, that's great. Thanks. Wow. I, I, I saw that on Facebook, and I was really appreciative of that. Yeah, I was too. Thank you very much, Tristan, for those very kind words. And those are kind words. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we've also received a couple of emails over the past week, and one was from someone that we met at Heroes Con last mm-hmm. week. You remember when Carlos Perez came to the table? Yes, and he told us that he is in an MFA program in sequential art, and he was asking us about graduate programs, doctoral programs, where he could specialize in comic studies. So he emailed us to say thanks for talking with me, and he told us that he just listened to our interview with Scott McCloud and appreciated that. So so that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was good to meet Carlos, and uh, it was nice to get that that comment. Exactly. Uh, we also got an email uh, from Jordan Sewer, and I'm not sure how you pronounce that name. It's S I E W E R. If I'm mispronouncing it, Jordan, then please forgive me. Uh, Jordan writes that he loves the podcast. I'm looking to find where you get the monthly preview information from upcoming monthly comics, which is a rather timely question Mm -hmm. since on today's episode we're talking about previews. I actually wrote Jordan back and said that, um, you know, we get it. You know, from I get mine copy from Discount Comic Book Service. Local shops have it. Mm. Uh, you can probably get it through the the Diamond or Previews World website. You can buy it. But I mean, there are many places of getting this. So uh, uh, Jordan likes the podcast, and I think that he subscribed to our YouTube channel. So that's cool. So Jordan, mm. thank you for the email. Yeah, thanks. And you know you brought up Heroes Con in there, and you know we've we've talked a little bit about that here and there. But um, I just wanted to say in general thanks to all the listeners who stopped by the table uh, to let us know they listen, and thanks to all the people who may be new listeners now who are just getting into the podcast um, after having met us. It was uh, it was a great time, and I was really happy to meet people. It's kind of it was kind of re-energizing for me to come back into the podcast post heroes con to be able to put you know faces to listeners uh as i as i said to some people when we were there um i often feel like this podcast is just you and me having a phone conversation about comics every week yeah and uh and to know that there's people out there that are listening and appreciate what we do is is really nice and really helps to kind of keep going with this but also a little bit daunting you know i like well really should i how how personal should i get from now on then <laughs> there are actually people listening yeah so the pressure's on but yeah. but i agree it, it was great to to meet some of our listeners and you know some people who came by to talk with us say that they've been listening to us for a long time mm-hmm. and then uh to those what I hope will be new listeners uh, who came up and wanted to know more about us and signed up for our mailing list. Uh, hey, welcome to the Comics Alternative. Yeah, and you know, not to to do an awkward segue here, but one of the things that people did mention to me, and I don't know if you were at the table when this this came up, but this came up a couple times. People said to me they really liked th- that their favorite episodes that we do are the previews episodes, and they really don't know how we do, you know, like how we do it. That we're doing kind of uh, special work here by going through the previews catalog, 
and and highlighting stuff that they said they they can't imagine what that process is like since the previous catalog is so daunting. Right. Uh, it, it it gets thicker it seems each month, but and you know th- that's, that's what a she good... said. What? <laughs> Okay. Now, see, actually, that that would have been a really good segue into our preview section. But before we get to that, yeah. I want to mention something that you will not, unfortunately, find in previews. And this is something that is linked to the comics alternative community. Our friend and occasional oh, yeah. co-host, Gene Cannonberg Jr., has just recently published his very first mini comic. It is called Comics Machine Number One, and you can find this by going to the website comicsearch.blogspot.com, or no, it's Comics Research. Comics. What did I say? Comics Search. I'm yeah. sorry. Comicsresearch.blogspot.com. You can. Uh, you may be also able to find it at comicschicago.wordpress.com. And uh, Andy, you, Gene sent both of us a copy of this number one issue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How would you describe Comics Machine? Well, what, what Gene's doing is he, as he has, has commented on online, um, that he's doing one, as he says, abstract-ish comic a day. Uh-huh. And so basically, these are abstract comics, but what Gene's doing that I think is really interesting is that he's taking kind of um, traditional comic page layouts, and you can even see this from the cover of it if, if you get a chance to take a look at the cover. The cover is kind of an homage to Superman number one mm-hmm. uh, in, in its layout, and the first page of... The issue, it looks like a, an homage to maybe a Kirby story of some kind. Uh, but it's abstract in that not only are, are you not getting kind of necessarily definable characters, but also um, he's invented his own um, language. language, if you will, like <laughs> letter, lettering. Uh, look, you know, It looks like it might be resembling... Uh, Arabic letters, but it is not. Uh, so anyway, it's there. Uh, it, it's a fun book to look at, and uh, you know, Gene is really doing some great work with with design and with the idea of abstract comics. Exactly. You know, in fact, I got in touch with Gene after he sent us this number one issue, and I asked, might there be some kind of code to understand the quote-unquote language that you're including in in this issue? And he was a little vague in his response, but Mm -hmm. he ultimately did say that if you guys can figure out what is being said here, then you know more about my comic than I do. Mm Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I wonder if the name Comics Machine is a is a callback to uh Gene Gene the Dancing Machine oh. from from the old Kong show. <laughs> you know, that's something. I don't know if I've ever called him that on air mm-hmm. when we've done a recording when he's co-hosted, but there have been several times that I have emailed him as Gene Gene the Dancing Machine. Yeah. Well, that's what I call him in my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, Gene, thank you very much for sending us a issue each of Comics Machine Number 1. And uh, for those of you wanting to find out more about this work, and I think you should check it out, definitely, mm-hmm. go to comicsresearch.blogspot.com. Mm-hmm. And one of the other sites he, he lists here where he does his abstractish comic a day is comicsmachine.tumblr.com. So... These these comics plus all the other ones that he's been doing regularly as a as a daily exercise um, is worth is worth definitely worth checking out. And I've been I've been keeping up with these through the Tumblr site and through his his Facebook page as well. Yeah, friend him on Facebook mm-hmm. if you haven't already. So, Andy, you want to get into the July previews catalog? Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think I think you're going to be surprised by this, 
I do, I do not have anything until we get to IDW. Really? Yes. So, and I don't I don't know if that's a response. It's if that's a kind of subconscious response to, you know, the fact that when I was listening to the previews episode from last month. <laughs> Um, I think I, I stopped listening somewhere in the third hour of your uh, discussion of the Dark Horse section up front of the catalog or not. But, you know, we're, uh, it, all, it also may be that, too, that most of the most of the Dark Horse section was number twos. You know, so yeah. you guys covered the stuff that came out. But I, I really think it's more of that, like, that episode... It was long. It was a long episode. It was long. There was a lot in there, though. In fact, I realized how much was in there when just a few days ago I finally submitted my uh, June order to Discount Comic Book Service and realized that I needed to cut back <laughs> significantly in order to uh, sustain a uh, you know decent bank account. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just sit back and listen to you talk about everything in the first 160 or so pages of the previous catalog, and then I'll I'll just jump in when when you're done. Okay, uh, I'll wake you up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, interestingly enough, I don't even have that much that I wanted to highlight in Dark Horse or in Vertigo, but I, I will. I do have a few things and. Okay. I, in Dark Horse, I first go to page 46 of the catalog, and I don't know if you're a fan of the goon. Are oh, yeah. You? Okay, yeah. I know that this is something that has been, at least for me, a long time in coming, and that is the goon library. Uh, I used to get issues of the goon as they come out, as they came out, and then I just kind of let it go for a while. But I've never gotten uh, the trades of the goon thinking – this is something that I would rather have in a hard copy mm. library edition, kind of like they do with uh, with Hellboy and BP, B, BPRD. And they finally now are coming out with Volume 1 hardcover of The Goon Library. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, a few years ago at Heroes Con, at this kind of infamous $5 trade tape booth that I go to every at the beginning of every, uh, or you know, on the beginning of the first day, um, I managed to pick up up to that point all of the goon trades. Oh, really? Uh, for five bucks a piece, yeah. So um, I I went through those, but this this is actually a nice collection. It's forty dollars, but it contains the first four trades. There's the zero trade, which is kind of the pre-existing goon material. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then volumes one through three of the uh, of the trade collection. So you get about 500 pages of comics for uh, 40 bucks, which is a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you're a fan of Eric Powell's The Goon, but you or like me and you didn't get the trades, or if you like Andy got the trades, but you just like hardcover big volumes, then hey. Coming soon, mm -hmm. the Goon Library, Volume One. Or if you haven't got, if you have never tried the Goon, this is of course the place to start. And um, again, like I said, pretty good deal, and probably even better deal on DCB service. That's right. I next go to page fifty-six in the Dark Horse section, and this is issue number one of the Paybacks, written by Donny Cates and Elliot Rahal, with art by Jeff Shaw and Lauren Affidy, who does the cover. Um, this just looked interesting, if for no other reason, just because it's uh, kind of an ironic take on the superhero genre, which we see every now and again. You know, from Dark Horse, Image, and, and otherwise. But uh, the solicit reads, heroism doesn't come cheap. So when superheroes borrow money to finance their genetic enhancements or crime-fighting supercomputers, their debts make student loans look like IOUs. Enter the Paybacks, a repo squad composed of bankrupt former heroes here to foreclose on everyone's secret layers. <laughs> so wow. this is from the people who brought us Buzzkill. Yeah, that that's an interesting take on um, on the superheroes. Mm -hmm. And you have one page of sample art, which looks pretty good. Yep. 
Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, this is another trade. This is Resident Alien Volume 3, the Sam Hain mystery. Now, I have not read this uh, when it was released in individual issues, but I did read the first arc of Resident Alien that came out in the first trade, and I really like this comic. Have you read any Resident Alien stories? No, but this is something that you know. Every time a volume comes out, you you recommend really strongly. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, what I'm waiting for is for them, and they may never do this, is to collect all the Resident Alien stories together because. You know, the trades are, I guess, relatively short because you're looking at, what is it, three no more than four issues of a particular narrative arc of Resident Alien. But I really like what uh, Peter Hogan and Steve Parkhouse do with this comic. I think it's a great conceit. Mm -hmm. And then finally, in the Dark Horse section, I go to page 73. Mm -hmm. Remember a few months ago, and I can't remember if it was when... The two of us did a previews, or if I did one with um, Wolverton, the Kurosaga, the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service Omnibus Book One came out. Was mm-hmm. it with you that we did this? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, you're back, and the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service Omnibus Book Two is now solicited on page seventy-three. Yeah, so, that's a, that's a nice looking book, and you know you get a, you get a load of comics in there for the price. Now, I won't be getting this one either because I already have volumes four through six. But, um, but yeah, if you're not – it's kind of like what you said about The Goon. If you're unfamiliar with The Goon, if you've never read The Goon, you know, now's the opportunity for people to jump on board with that first library edition. Mm-hmm. If you've never read the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service, it's a great series. You can now find the Omnibus Book 2 for nineteen ninety nine, and I'm sure the DCB service will have an incredible discount on that. Yep. And so that's all I have in Dark Horse. So now I'm going to go to the Vertigo section. And now I'm working from a PDF, not a hard copy, so it's always a little more difficult to navigate. Mm -hmm. But one thing worth mentioning is that um, in a couple of months, we should, I'm not saying we will, but (laughs) we should have the final issue of the Sandman Overture. So that's issue number six. Um, I'm not going to count on that, but you know, they say mm-hmm. it'll be out in September. But I'm hoping what will be out that next month, November, is the Sandman Overture Deluxe Edition. And this is on page 143 of the catalog in the Vertigo section. Right. So, I, you know, I would... I, I, have you read... Have you been keeping up with the Sandman Overture? Um, yeah, yeah, I have, but I've, um, I think I got the last issue and didn't read it because I want to, um, I'm going to probably end up just reading all six issues all together, uh, because it is, it is one that I, I feel like is, is pretty dense and maybe if it were coming out month to month, it would be okay, but, um. You know, I'd be able to follow it, but because it's coming out like year to year, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's uh, I'm going to wait uh, and and read it all together. Yeah, same here. I, after the second issue, I more or less decided I'm just going to wait until everything comes out and everything's collected. So I haven't read past issue two. So I'm looking forward to this um, this deluxe edition finally coming out. Yes, and I'm assuming it'll come out this year. Mm-hmm. We'll see. And then the only other thing I have in the Vertigo section is on page 147, and this is another uh, series or a mini-series that's been collected, and that is Fables, The Wolf Among Us. So that is by, by October we'll be wrapping up, and you can find the trade on sale for nineteen ninety nine, but at a discount, I'm sure, from Discount Comic Book Service. So that – Okay, I, I thought that The Wolf Among Us is an ongoing series. Well, you know, it might be, because it does say Volume 2, and they wouldn't say Volume... I'm sorry, Volume 1, but they wouldn't uh-huh. say Volume 1 if there wasn't any kind of follow-ups. So. Right, and plus above that is Issue 9, and oh, this oh. volume collects Issues 1 through 8. Okay, so for you not to be focusing on anything until you get to IDW, apparently you're reading the Vertigo section closer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right there. And, you know... I, 
I guess at first when this came out, I was thinking that maybe The Wolf Among Us would be a mini series to kind of punctuate the end of Fables. Mm. But now that this is something that's kind of ongoing, I, I don't know. I wish they wouldn't do that. If they're going to end something, end something. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, and I think this is this is more kind of to tap into the the audience that they might be getting from the the game, right? Um, which is a, a fun game anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Plus, I like Matthew Sturges, so I'm not going to you know begrudge them for you know carrying fables past the expiration date. Yeah. If you want to look at it that way. Yeah. You know, one of the things I wanted to mention about the Vertigo section is not what's here, but what's not here. Um, I haven't seen Effigy solicited for a a few months now. Issue 7 was the last one that was solicited. Hmm. But it wasn't listed as the final issue. When was that? I don't know. That was a a while ago. Huh. So I'm not sure what. I guess it was two or three months ago. So I'm not sure what's... I know they've, they've solicited the trade... Maybe they're waiting to see how the trade does before yeah. going on. But the Vertigo section's gotten a little thin. Yeah. Well, you know, Tim, you can call them up and ask them what the deal is there. Yeah, I guess. That's true. I can. Um, and then just to, I mean, I said I go to IDW, but on the next page, there are two collections on page 148. Uh, I didn't read Suiciders, did you? No. Uh, so I'm not sure, but that hardcover collection comes out. Uh, and then um, in November, and then in late October is uh, the collection of Wolf Moon by Colin Bunn and Jeremy Hahn, and we uh, we did review the first issue of that series. That's right. On the show, and so that collects the, that entire mini series. And we had a good time talking to Jeremy Hahn at and Colin Colin Bunn at HeroesCon. Yeah, and our plan is to interview both of them, not not together, but to have both of them on the show at some point in the maybe not distant future. Yeah. Yeah. You know, getting back to Suicide, I feel a little remiss because that's a Vertigo title. I haven't even read issue one of that. No. And I, I had been an avid Vertigo reader that even if something that I wouldn't necessarily continue with, I would you know try the first one or two issues. But Suiciders just came and went for me. I didn't read it. And I don't know if that says anything about Vertigo or maybe something about my reading habits because I feel now about image comics what I used to feel about Vertigo. Part of, part of it for me was that um, – it's a it's a kind of a post apocalyptic story uh, or dystopian future story, and I got kind of burned out on those. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, and in fact, that's kind of when I when I was going through this previews, that might be a, a theme for this entire previews is stuff I'm not talking about because I'm burned out on that genre. Mm. Uh, and it's not just the post apocalyptic stuff. There are other things as well we'll get to eventually? Po- possibly, if, if okay. you mention them and I don't. But, um, but yeah, yeah, so um, it does seem to be that there's several genres that the um, kind of non-superhero stuff is lending itself towards more and more. Mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering how much, how much longer those genres will be viable. But anyway, so we'll we'll see if that comes up. Okay, so you said that you have something in IDW. Yeah. Um not until page 161, so if you have something earlier in that I've marked 161 as well, so okay. let's go there. Okay. So you're not going to talk about the Star Wars Art Edition thing? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so 161 is um, has an IDW has a, has a double helping of uh, Atomic Robo. Now, Atomic Robo has normally been published by Red 5 Comics, mm-hmm. so... Atomic Robo and the Ring of Fire number one is the first um, issue of their the series of miniseries under 
the IDW banner. Um, and so this is this is going to, I guess, a address the the disappearance of uh, Atomic Robo, and the search for him. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that Atomic Robo now is going to IDW. I mean, IDW does a lot of great things, and mm -hmm. you know, they've even lost some things over the past year that they did really well. You know, case in point, Doctor Who. Now, the Doctor Who seems to be going really well with Titan, but you know, I kind of felt bad that that IDW lost that. But now they've got an Atomic Robo, and <laughs> uh, it's funny when I was first going through the catalog. And you know, I was reading through the IDW section mm -hmm. when I first saw this, as you put it, you know, this this one-two punch of the Atomic Robo, which is on page 161, issue number one of Atomic Robo and the Ring of Fire, and then Atomic Robo, the Everything Explodes collection, which basically collects uh, the narrative arcs, the Fighting Scientist of uh, uh, Tesla Dine, the Dogs of War, and the Shadow from Beyond Time. In, in, in one volume. When I saw that, I said, oh, it's good to see Atomic Robo back. Oh, they're collecting those earlier stories in one larger volume. And it took me a beat or two to realize, hey, wait a minute. This is not in the, you know, the Red Five mm -hmm. uh, section. You know, this is in IDW. So it was, I guess, the, my, the reading version of a double take. It's yeah. like my brain went, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Red Five is still a going concern. They have uh, they have a uh, set of solicitations in this issue. In mm -hmm. fact, so yeah, but but unfortunately, they lost Atomic Robo, and I mean, I don't know about their sales, but it seems that that would have been their biggest draw. But I'm sure that Clevenger and Wegner. Are, you know, are, are mm -hmm. glad that they're going to be probably getting better distribution this way, but definitely much more visibility because IDW is is quite large. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, although you know, it was nice every now and again to go to smaller conventions and see a uh, a Red Five table or a mm -hmm. booth there where they would talk about comics like Atomic Robo and the other things that they've had, which is something that IDW would not do at these smaller cons. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. But, um, so anybody who hasn't gotten into Atomic Robo, you Now's definitely can, can. This is kind of like, uh, you know, with, with what we just talked about with the goon, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, getting three, three collections in one volume, is a uh, is a good deal, but and it, those those three collections are really really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you know that uh, that was something we did fairly early on in the podcast. Uh, within our first, I don't know, three four months, we talked about a lot of Atomic Robo. Yeah, we did. What else do you have in IDW? Um, I go to the. I think I go to the IDW. Um, top shelf section next okay because i have a few things before that uh um, and i'll just mention it briefly okay. on page 163 there's issue number one of dave two by ryan ferrier uh, art by valentine ramon i don't know did you read any of any issues of dave either through idw or on monkey brain no no i didn't but you you and was it andy talked yeah. about that uh first issue on the show and i did i did get that first issue yeah, Dave, Dave is a, a fun series, and so I'm glad that they're going to be continuing with this Dave coming from Monkey Brain with Dave, too. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. And then let me see, what page is the Top Shelf stuff on? Um, I, I have 187 marked. I'm not sure if that's the beginning of it or not. Okay, because on 184, volume number three of Haunted Horror, mm -hmm. uh, our friend Craig Yo whom we saw at Heroes Con. We hung out with him quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and his table was right catty cornered from ours, and so that mm -hmm. was helpful. But the third volume of Haunted Horror is going to be coming out. So yep. you can check that out on page 184. Yep. And then on, on page 185, and this is also a Yo book, mm -hmm. um, is Walt Kelly's Fairy Tales, uh, a collection of the, um, basically, the fairy tale stories that Walt Kelly... Um, Walt Kelly did, and 
th- this is one of those. You know, Walt Kelly is, of course, most famous for Pogo, and uh, it is in these fairy tale stories, though, where a lot of his really is really imaginative style shines through. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, this this is a highly recommended collection. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to that. I don't know if I'll get it, but if I if if I can get it, I, I'd want to. Get Craig on the show. Get Craig on the show. Hey, another reason for us to have him back. Yep. He's always a fun guest. Mm-hmm. And then in the top shelf section, do you go to page 186? Uh, I go to 187. Oh, I'm sorry, 187, yes. Yeah, and so this is um, you know, uh, The Story of My Tits by Jennifer Hayden. This is top shelf. Really, you know, one of the one of the areas where Top Shelf really shines is in their autobiographical comics and memoirs, mm-hmm. and so this is um, Jennifer Hayden's graphic memoir about uh, her experience with breast cancer at the age of forty three, um, and so there there have been uh, there there's almost a kind of subgenre of autobiographical comics that are cancer narratives. Right. Like uh, Cancer Vixen and Cancer Made Me uh, a Shallower Person and uh, Mom's Cancer. Mom's and Cancer. And so on. Uh, so this is a common um, a common topic of autobiographical comics. But I think Hayden takes a really interesting approach to it, which is this is literally the story, you know, not just the cancer part of the narrative, but this is the story of her breasts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she talks about, or at least in the solicit, uh, it says that you know she grew up flat-chested, and it was only after she went off to co- and you know that you know defined her in certain ways, and then mm-hmm. she went off to college, she bloomed, and you know that was another defining moment uh, or time of her life. So you're right. I, th- th- yeah, this this does look exciting. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, this is. This this has the potential, and and we get a couple panels of of her art style, and I like it as you know she has a strong indie art style. Uh, mm-hmm. So um, I I think this has the potential to be one of the one of the big books of 2015. Yeah, um, I think that at 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 the minimum we should include this on one of the review shows. But you know I think it would be fun to do a publisher spotlight on on Top Shelf. Yeah, that's that's entirely possible. It'd be a lot of work, so we're gonna have to discuss that. Yeah, yeah. We like doing publisher spotlights, but they do require a lot of planning and time for prep or preparation. Mm-hmm. Now I go to the next page, one eighty-eight. This looks fun. King of the Comics: One Hundred Years of King Features Syndicate. Mm-hmm. And this is part of IDW's Library of American Comics. And so here you have a collection of comics, including Crazy Cat, Popeye, Flash Gordon, Beetle Bailey, Blondie, Prince Valiant, Hagar the Horrible, on and on and on and on. There just is a lot here. Mm-hmm. And this is 288 pages. Yeah. Yeah, even going up to the present day with um, series like Zitz. Yeah, exactly. And you know, something I didn't see up here, uh, one of the strips that's under King Features that's not up here, is Zippy the Pinhead. That's that's right. Um, and maybe it's in here, but it's just not part of the solicit or on the cover. But my guess is, if it's not mentioned here, chances are it's probably not part of this collection. Mm-hmm. But but on the cover is um, is Henry. Oh, yeah. And Henry Henry always freaked the hell out of me because he doesn't have a mouth. I think I think you've mentioned that before on yeah. the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm the same way. It disturbed me in a way I didn't know how to articulate when I was a kid. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, I, it was when I was growing up. We you know we would get the Fargo Forum, the Fargo newspaper, and it would have Henry in it. And I didn't realize until much much later that Henry had stopped. Like new Henry comics had stopped, <coughs> excuse me, way earlier, and we were just getting reruns, mm-hmm. and that wasn't as common of a practice back then as it is, you know, today with you know, peanuts and and strips like that. So I, that was even more disturbing that 
there was such a demand for Henry in the the Fargo area that they couldn't get rid of the strip. They mm-hmm. had to just run reruns when it ended. What was have, it about Fargo that demanded Henry? I, I don't know. <laughs> you can answer that. I that's can't. That's a mystery. No, that's a mystery I'll never understand. Well, maybe it's something like the movie. It's an enigma. Yeah, there you go. I only got. Uh, I only have one other thing in IDW, and that's on page 190. Okay. And that is Tet. This is issue number one of a four-issue miniseries written by Paul Aller with art by Paul Tucker. And it just looks interesting. Uh, It says, Eugene Smith is desperate to leave Vietnam behind and begin a new life with the woman he loves. But when a fellow Marine is brutally murdered on the eve of the Tet Offensive, Eugene's plans are thrown away forever. It says this is a heartfelt story of hard-boiled crime and star-crossed romance set at the height of the Vietnam War and the decades that followed. So, I mean, that's a lot for this to be just a four-issue miniseries, but the premise seems intriguing. Yeah. Um, And another thing about this is if you look at the bottom of page 190, the solicit, there's a little icon there that says Comics Experience. And then underneath that at the bottom of the page, there is or there are the words creator visions from IDW. Now, is this a new – not imprint, but new um, effort from IDW to kind of uh, brand their new creator-owned stuff? Yeah, I'm not sure. Experience? I'm not sure. I don't sure. know. So, but that brings us to the end of the IDW section, which – then leads us to image, which is always fruitful. Yeah. So what do you what do you have in image? Well, first and foremost uh, is the solicit on page one ninety two, and we have sample art as we usually get from image, and this is Tokyo Ghost. Uh, this is written by Rick Remender and Sean Murphy and Matt Hollingsworth do the art. And in, any time there's Sean Murphy, I'm on board. Uh, almost any time there's Rick Remender, I'll, I'll I'll be on board. So it's it's kind of like peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah, um, it's more like to me. It's more like chocolate and I don't know something that I don't necessarily really like the taste of, but can stomach. Well, like okay, so <laughs> so Sean Murphy's the chocolate, and Rick Rick Remender. Is kind of hit or miss for me, so okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait on this and uh, and see what the what the response has been. It it seems interesting. Uh, the premise uh, the, the solicit reads: The Isles of Los Angeles, 2089. Humanity is speaking of post apocalyptic. Mm-hmm. Uh, humanity is addicted to technology. A population of unemployed leisure seekers, blissfully distracted from the toxic contamination who borrow, steal, and kill to buy their next digital fix. Getting a virtual buzz is the only thing left to live for. It's the biggest industry. The only industry. The drug everyone needs and gangsters run it all. And who do these gangsters turn to when they need their rule enforced? Constables Lead, Dent, and Debbie Decay. Okay, kind of, you know, Heavy names there. Uh, The duo is about to be given a job that will force them out of the familiar squalor of Los Angeles to take down the last techless country on Earth, the Garden Nation of Tokyo. Thus, the title, I guess, Tokyo Ghost. Right, right. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that I often feel about Reminder stuff is that he's really good at the high concept. So you can you can kind of see the hook uh, of the series, and it's and so the reason why I say I'm going to wait until um, until I, I kind of hear more about it, or or even see maybe a preview, or, uh, a, a deeper preview than what we get here uh, with um, with dialogue. Uh, the three pages we get don't have dialogue on it. Um, is to kind of find out if. If it is something I'm, I'm going to be interested in, uh, in the long haul. But Reminder's prolific as hell. Yeah. Uh, the guy can can pump out a lot of a lot of books, and the and Murphy's art looks great. This is, this oh, yeah. is the kind of thing that Murphy does really well. So. 
Well, what do you think of Black Science, Deadly Class, and Low? You know, uh, those none of those. Well, let's see. I uh, I didn't like the first issue of Black Science, so I haven't followed that. Though I've heard a lot of people love it, mm-hmm. and I know a lot of people love Deadly Class, but I never um, never got into that either. Okay, because I like all three of those, and I really like Black Science. So you just you haven't read past the first issue? No, no. Okay. Um, another thing worth noting here is uh, now Sean Murphy does not include a middle name here because when you know he did with Miller uh, the Chrononauts just recently, uh, what was the what was his full name? I don't remember. Sean, I don't know something Murphy. I can't remember either because I had I had wondered when that was solicited if you remember why his middle name because in everything else I had seen from him it was just Sean Murphy. Mm-hmm. Now Sean Murphy. Yep. Um, where do you go next in image? I think uh, I know. Oh, well, I'm, I just go right to the next page. Yeah. Or uh, one ninety six. Um, with. Pluton, Plutona, mm-hmm. uh, with uh, written by Jeff Lemire and M- Emmy Lennox, and drawn by Emmy Lennox, with colors by the incredibly prolific Jordi Belair, and um, and uh, this this I think has been we've seen ads for this in the back of Descender mm-hmm. in the the first couple issues of that series, and so this isn't kind of coming out of nowhere but uh it's definitely it's one of the new lemire books that now that he's kind of free of his exclusive contracts is uh is doing with um with image along with descender and and other stuff coming out yeah and it says that Emmy Lennox is, is a newcomer. But, you know, looking at the sample art mm-hmm. here that follow on pages, what, 197, 198, uh, her art style seems to work really well with the Jeff Lemire that we have come to love mm-hmm. in terms of his art. Right. And um, right, and they're, they're co-writing this. So, um, you know, that may be somewhere down the, down the road. Lennox will be doing this book solo, uh, but uh, right now it says the uh, it's the story of five suburban kids who make a shocking discovery while exploring the woods one day after school. The body of Plutona, the world's greatest superhero, a dark and heartbreaking journey about friendship and coming of age, all through the lens of the superhero genre. So it's it looks like it's an interesting take on superheroes in that it's. It's in a world in which there are superheroes, but the five kids that we follow are not themselves superheroes, as far as we right. know. Right. So, And I think it's funny now that in solicits, this being one example, that you know the, the, they'll mention an auth, a writer or an artist and then parenthetically give one, two, or maybe three titles that they're known for, something to catch the attention of the reader. Mm. Here in the solicit with Jeff Lemire, they have Descender and Hawkeye. Yeah. So the Jeff Lemire that we knew before that is not mentioned here, which, which I find – I mean I have no problem with it. I just found it, find it mm-hmm. curious because – you know, there's no mention of his creator-owned stuff. There's no mention here of his Vertigo stuff. But you know, people who are looking for new titles, they may know him by Hawkeye now and Descender and uh, Sweet Tooth. They may say, "What's that?" You know, right. or Essex County. You know, what are you talking about? You mm-hmm. know, this this strange thing, underwater welder. What is this you speak of? Yeah, Trillium. Go to hell. Get away from me. <laughs> Why are you talking to me? <laughs> I didn't okay. I didn't approach you. I don't know yeah. you at all. That's what happens when I have random conversations with people on the street about Jeff Lemire's work. Really? No, I uh, never that, that never happened. That, that's an experience of yours <laughs> I, I I've never heard. Yeah, I just stand on the corner. <laughs> uh so yeah, you have a reputation in town then, huh? Yeah. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. Uh it looks good. What else? Because you know, Image always has quite a number of new releases. Is, are there other ones that really stand out to you? Um, 
I, d- I don't know. Uh, I guess I, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on these. I, I'm curious about, um, on page 204, From Under Mountains, mm-hmm. uh, which is a, a fantasy series, and that's not normally my genre of choice, but uh, it's written by Claire Gibson and Marion Churchland and drawn by Sloane Leong, and it looks very nice. Right. Uh, and then... Um, on page 206 is Head Lopper by Andrew McLean, which uh, pre-exists it, its image um, uh, iteration, but I, I'm not familiar with it. No, yeah. And that looks that looks like it's more along the lines of, um, I don't know what uh, what am I what am I thinking of like like Prison Pit. <laughs> <laughs> or something, you know. It's that's it's interesting. Like, I never thought of Prison Pit looking at that solicit. Like uh, just a, a kind of violent, hilariously violent fantasy series. Yeah, I think it probably has a more coherent narrative than Prison Pit does, but um, and maybe less, maybe fewer penises. Probably. Know. This is funny because. Uh, Johnny Ryan has come up in more conversations I have had over the past month than in the past, let's say, two years. Wow, huh? With me, and you know, I, I probably have instigated at least some of those because of that uh, uh, Angry Youth Comics collection that came out just the other month. Yep, that was that was a guilty pleasure of mine, getting that and reading all those things again. Mm-hmm. Fun stuff. <laughs> But we won't go there. Um, yeah, both of those from Under Mountain and Headlopper I'm interested in. I'm also interested in this original graphic novel that is solicited on page 210. Yeah. Not that I'll get it, but uh, I might. Virgil, uh, written by Steve Orlando with art by J.D. Faith. So, yeah, because um, that looks like more of a, a noir story. Right. And you don't have much of a solicit, but what's there, you know, it says, Betrayed, beaten, and banished by his own. An outed cop fights his way across Jamaica for revenge. Mm -hmm. And that's probably enough, because then you have that one page of art, which is actually four sample pages on one previews Mm -hmm. page. Mm -hmm. And it looks good. Yeah. And I like what Steve Orlando's, he's only one issue in on, um, on the Midnighter series mm-hmm. for DC, but I, I've liked what he's done with that so far. So yeah. I may check that out based on the strength of that work. I've only got one other thing in image. I don't know about if you have anything. Now I didn't, you know, I didn't look at previews last month because I wasn't on the, the previous show and God, why would I want to do that if I didn't have, have to, <laughs> um, is, but the the way the pre the image preview section is laid out is different than it normally was before that. Was this instituted last month? It was the month before last, I believe. Oh, okay. Well, then even then I wasn't paying attention. So it was back in May that they, they do this. And at first I thought, oh, well, this is pretty cool because what they do is they give you a breakdown by week which new titles are coming out. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is that when I – and I realized this after making that comment on I think the May preview show. When I you know went to order my comics uh, using the DCB service order form, the Excel sheet – um, the pages sometimes, well, they corresponded with the, I guess, week by week breakdown, not the larger solicit, um, mm-hmm. pages that, that basically we've been discussing. So there, there's some good things to this new image layout or organization of their part of previews, but on the other hand, it can be a little confusing. Yeah. You know, maybe did I, I guess I didn't do the May, May previous show either no no uh andy wolverton did both may and yeah okay so that's why i didn't i didn't notice this change um the the finding out what's coming out week to week is okay but there there's literally no solicitation text for any of the books that are beyond the first issue Mm -hmm. in in the image section now and you know i find image already doesn't seem to do much to promote their series beyond the first issue anyway. 
and now that you don't even know what's say you know in the the latest issue of um, you know manifest destiny or whatever uh, don't know what the plot is it's it's kind of weird yeah uh, like but I, said, I guess if there's a new story arc like with with revival and with um uh, the tithe and uh, what's the other one the fade out uh, they do do a little more solicitation but otherwise not much yeah pluses and minuses and and who knows if they'll keep this this organization mm-hmm um, the only other things that I wanted to mention, uh, and these appear on pages 236 and 237. Oh, I got to go s- before that, if that's okay. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, wanted to mention, because on 232, this is another series that's, that's been collected before, but is getting a more you know, high-end hardcover collection, is the series Proof by Alex Grecian, Riley Rosmo, and others. Did you ever read Proof? I did not. Yeah, so I guess this is another. You know, this this seems to be the month for these these kinds of things. So you got you've got the um, Atomic Robo, Atomic Robo, the Goon, and now Goon. Absolute Proof, mm-hmm. uh, collecting the first two arcs of the original series plus some backup stories and and sketchbook material. It doesn't say much, but about what the series is about, but it's basically taking the um, kind of the major legends of uh you know I don't know what you want what you want to call it. Basically so you've got you've got, you know, uh Bigfoot is a character in there and and this team investigates those kinds of those kinds of legends. They're not really urban legends, but you know you know what I mean. So like a cross between In Search of and X Files. Yeah. Yeah, but if if the team that was doing the searching were the legends themselves, legends themselves. Um, so that that's the only that's the one thing I wanted to mention before you, you got you go to two thirty six, right? And then two thirty seven, and these are both hardcovers, just like that new proof mm-hmm. volume. And there's a lot of hardcovers in in this month's that issue that we're we're highlighting. Uh, one, uh, the one on uh, page 236 is Rat Queen's Deluxe Hardcover Volume Two. So this collects Rat Queens one through ten, and also the number one issue of Rat Queens Braga. And you know that's a series both you and I have have discussed. I don't know if we've discussed on the show, but I know that. Mm-hmm. At least off the show, we we talk about it. And then on the following page is the Southern Bastards Book One Premier Hardcover. So if you waited around for to get your Southern Bastards fill, um, in you know maybe holding out for a hard copy, well, the wait is now worth the while because now you have a hard copy. Uh, premiere. So this will include Southern Bastards 1 through 8. It says... Well, actually, that's all it says. It would be interesting if this collected more than just issues 1 through 8. And it might. You know, for instance, uh, additional art or, you know, something. Uh, essays or whatever. But they don't mention that. Right. You would think that if this is billed as a premiere hardcover that there would be more than just issues one through eight. That's right. So I hope that that's the case. Mm, we'll see. We'll see. And with that, I'm, I'm done with uh, Image. Okay. I'm done with Image, man! Yeah, so I, I go to um, Ad House on page 250. Well, before before we go to Ad House, I'm going to bring up something in Marvel, and we rarely talk about Marvel. Oh, I didn't even look at Marvel, so go ahead. Yeah, well, now, I, I'm not referring to the page of the Marvel previews, uh, but on page 244 of the regular previews catalog, there's a uh, – so, well, not a solicit, but an ad, a one-page ad for – Captain America, White, issue number one. And this is from Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale. 
Um, it's about time. I just wanted to say. Yeah, you can cross that off the list of as as long as it does finally now come out, actually come out. Cross <laughs> that off the list of long delayed comic projects. Yeah, um, I really like the I guess the colored series that Loeb and Sale did, however many years ago it was. You know, the one on Hulk, uh, Spider Man, and uh, Iron Man. Is Iron Man gray, Hulk green, right? And then Spider Man was blue. Mm -hmm. And now this one's white. Now I've got issue zero of this, and in fact, I took issue zero with me to Heroes Con because I thought, oh, you know, Tim Sale's going to be there. Maybe. I can get him to sign it. I didn't get him to sign it because every time I went by the table, he was – well, he wasn't signing. He had certain times that he would sign. And when he did, but, have, when he did sign, his line was massive. I know. I know. So yeah. um, He was one talk- of the guys that had massive lines all weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I didn't know about this uh, at the time, but it's good that this is finally going to come out if it does come out. So mm-hmm. we'll see. Um, okay, like you, I also go to Ad House. Okay, and so that's on page two fifty. Mm-hmm. And um, Ad House is advertising a hard hardcover of Gigant by Rune Ryberg, a Danish creator, mm-hmm. um, and it's described as a color saturated action packed fantasy comedy. The hero. Uh, is thrown into a bizarre journey within another dimension in an attempt to rescue his girlfriend, who has been swallowed by a thousand-eyed monster. Um, I don't necessarily think that this is a book to get for its plot anyway. It, it looks like it's going to be a great, you know, art book mainly. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and Ad House puts out a lot of great books that have nice, um, you know. Um, Unconventional art styles, so right? I'm looking forward to to seeing that. Yeah, you know, two weeks ago, Wolverton and I did a publisher spotlight on Ad House, and, and that was a fun show. Uh, we looked at the books that they have come out with up to and including July, mm-hmm. and uh, and then I had the pleasure of meeting in person because I talked with him in a brief interview for that publisher spotlight show. Uh, uh, Chris Pitzer, but I met him at Heroes Con last week. Yeah. So that was great. He's a really nice guy, yeah. and I also got to to you know talk with the various people they had around the Ad House table. So, you know, you had the, Jim Rugg was there, the Eminents were there, and, and they were very very friendly and pleasant. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Sophie Goldstein as well. So yeah, th- in fact, I think the for me in terms of people who had creators or even publishers who had tables mm-hmm. at Heroes Con. One of the highlights for me was the, the ad house section. Yeah, I wish I had spent more time there. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't even get stuff signed by the Eminence, which I, I brought with. So. Oh. Uh, I just never, never, never spent a lot of time in that area, even though it was not that far from our thing. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I got their their new book with Ad House. I got a copy of it there because at the time when we did the Ad House Publisher Spotlight, I only had a PDF, so I wanted to get a hard copy because I really liked the book. And both of the Eminents did a great, uh, I guess, signing uh, uh, in, in, in the book. So I, I really appreciate it at the time. In, in fact, when, uh, when I introduced myself as one of the co-hosts of the Comics Alternative, I think they had just recently listened to that show because it, it, it had come out about two or three days before. And both of them did a little bow in front of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I felt, uh, I felt touched, which is different from the way I usually feel touched. But we won't go into that. Yep. And I'm not making a sexual comment there. I meant something else by that. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, okay, so I go next. I don't know if you have anything before 259. No, that's where I go to, and that's alternative comics, I'm assuming. Yeah. Almost everything on this page, I think with one exception, is coming out from alternative comics, or I guess we could say the co-op of mm-hmm. alternative mm-hmm. comics. Because remember earlier this year they announced that they were doing... This uh, co-op with a lot of uh, smaller um, I don't know, craft publishers, uh, 
you know, like Hickok mm-hmm. and and others. So we have four here, and I think all of them look really good. Uh, I, I'm particularly drawn to the new book by Dean Haspiel, Beef with Tomato. Yeah. Yeah, have you read – now, this is the follow-up to Opposable Thumbs. Have you read Opposable Thumbs? I have not read Opposable Thumbs. Have ne- you? Neither have I, and, and I guess this is part of the uh, a semi-autobiographical series that Haspiel's doing. Yes. Uh, so that looks good. And also good is the Hickok Journal of Humor, Volume 2, the UK, because Hickok has come out – they may, I think with just two, uh, I'm, maybe I'm wrong here, but the, the Hickok Journal of Humor, Volume 1, the United Kingdom, and then Hickok Journal of Humor, Volume 1, the United States. So now they got the second volume of the UK. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good anthology. So we've talked a few times on the podcast about the need for more alternative comics anthologies, and so I think this is one to, uh, should de- definitely check out. Yep. And what about Schmuck? Yeah, Schmuck looks really interesting. I think of, of I, you know, I, I like Dean Haspiel's work, so I'm looking forward to Beef with Tomato, but Schmuck seems like the most interesting uh, in the book that I'm looking forward to the most out of the alternative comics list here. Um it's by it's written by Seth Kushner and drawn by Josh Newfeld and Various and it, and Various includes uh, what the solicit says is twenty two different artists uh, yeah. and so I'm really curious to see who else is included in this um, you know Josh Newfeld's no uh, no Piker so anyway uh, it's about Adam Kessler who is a pop culture obsessed New York photographer torn between pleasing his mom and finding a nice Jewish girl and figuring out what he really wants an awkward coming of age story illustrated by 22 artists whose individual short stories together tell a complete narrative that's an interesting idea and yeah of course you you're you're a big Jewish lit guy so I would guess that this is right up your alley too oh yeah this is one I definitely want to check out mm-hmm and the way that the solicit is described, you know, torn between his mother and finding a nice Jewish girl. I mean, you know, how many Jewish narratives have that as a premise, mm-hmm. especially by male writers? Yep. Yeah. Uh, now, d- the other book that's solicited in the alternative comics uh, section is Smoke from Gregory Benton. I- I'm not familiar with Gregory Benton. Are you? No. No. Looks interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't have anything until page 283, and I'll probably just mention that in passing. Oh, okay, so I have a few things before then. Okay. So, um, on page 268, mm-hmm. I don't know if Archie counts as an alternative comic, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna uh, to throw Archie in there. Sure, it's, it's not a superhero <laughs> mainstream title, so it's fair game. Um but yeah, but probably has just as much cultural saturation as any superhero comic. But I just want to highlight this because uh, in you know in Archie's Archie Comics' revamping of their their main characters, uh, we had a few months ago solicited the new issue, issue of Archie, written by Mark Wade and drawn by Fiona Staples, mm-hmm. and now. Uh, I think an even better pairing is Jughead with art by, or excuse me, written by Chip Zdarsky with art by Erica Henderson. Um, we got to see, well, we got to see both Chip and Erica at Heroes Con. Chip was a little harder to get to, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, I did spend time talking to Erica, and I'm really looking forward to um, looking forward to their take on this. I think. Um, Erica's got a great style that works really well for a series like this, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm curious to see what Chip's sense of humor does with Jughead. Yeah, now I think that Zadarsky, I would well, I would guess, I expect that his sense of humor in Jughead might work better than some of the other work that he's done over the past few months. And okay. I, you know, you and I have talked before, and I think it was one of, uh, in one of our uh, Patreon exclusive shows. So most of our listeners haven't heard that. I wasn't very taken by the first issue of Howard the Duck. 
Huh. Okay. Uh, and and he, I thought it was okay. But... Yeah, we talked about that on like one of our what one of our extra shows. Yes, exactly. And if you want to listen to those, hey, you can be- you can become a Patreon supporter for fifteen dollars. So anyway, um, but yeah, I thought it was okay, but it didn't bowl me over. And the same thing with issue number one of what is that image comic, Keptara? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was good, but the humor was forced. Hmm. I, I, I just I got the sense that he was trying too much to live up to the reputation now that he has after sex criminals. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't go on to read issue number two yet, but uh, um, I would just guess that the, I guess the sheer weight of the Archie legend may tone down uh, some, some of that need to, you know, overtly be humorous and, it could it could be maybe a different tone of humor in Jughead number one. At least that's what I'm mm-hmm. thinking might happen. Uh, again, I mean, I think that Zdarsky was was pretty good in writing both Howard the Duck and Keptara. It's just that I think th- the humor seemed a little too much for me, too forced. Mm-hmm. But I love his work on sex criminals. Yep. Okay. And then the next thing I have is on on page two seventy one. Which is um, the cast Arsenal Pulp Press's Castro graphic novel, mm-hmm. uh, written and drawn by Reinhard Kleist. Kleist, I was going to say Kleist. Kleist. Yep. And uh, and so I just thought that was interesting. Um, is um, the life and times of Fidel Castro, but narrated by a German journalist named Karl Mertens. Uh, who is plunged into pre-revolutionary Cuba in the mid-1950s. He first meets with Castro while the latter is hiding in the mountains, and then the revolution in his presidency that lasts for nearly 50 years. Um, I've I've appreciated the various um, graphic novel uh, biographies of other revolutionary leaders. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are several of Che Guevara, for example, and so uh, I'm curious about this one. You know, I'm glad that you've mentioned this for at least two reasons. I think first and foremost, I missed this one. Mm-hmm. This was one of those that in going through the catalog this month, I overlooked. So, And I know that we've discussed some Arsenal Pulp Press stuff in the past. They do, they do good books. So this is good. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. But the other reason I'm glad is just this weekend, I read another book by Reinhard Kleist. Mm. What would you um, read? The Boxer. This came out last year from Self Made Hero. Yeah. I've had it for a while. I've just been meaning to. Have you read it? No. No. It's also uh, a biography. This one is of the Holocaust survivor Harry Haft, who mm. was a boxer. Uh, he, he, um, he grew up in Poland. He you know, served time in a concentration camp, made his way out over to the United States, became a boxer. And so it's a really good story. And then looking at this solicit that you just read, it's curious because you pointed out that this is Castro's story narrated through the eyes of a journalist. And in The Boxer, what Kleist does is something similar. He framed the story of Harry Hoft through um, – or at least the very beginning and very end of, um, uh, of uh, Hoft's son – Mm-hmm. So maybe that's a particular narrative strategy that Kleist uses, but I really liked the boxer, so that makes me want to read Castro all the more. Yeah. So, do you have anything before two eighty three? Not for mention two eighty three. No, in fact, I don't have anything there either. So go ahead. Okay, let me get to that page because I'm scrolling. Two eighty three. Okay, mm-hmm. I just want to mention this for its title. This is from the publisher Black Sheep Comics, which I've never heard of before. Uh, Usagi Jane and the Skull Bunnies. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just say that again. Usagi Jane and the Skull Bunnies. Yep. There you go. No, it just seemed interesting. I'm not going to get this, but I thought that not only the title, but the concept was interesting. This is by Ben Sito, and this is volume one of this. It says, join Usagi, Jane, and the Skull Bunnies as they save a city from a Cyclops monster, travel to the spirit world, ride a giant snow mole, and face off with a hungry jelly dragon in the very first volume of 
Usagi Jane and the Skull Bunnies. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, so that's all I have to say about that. Mm-hmm. Next, uh, uh, I move on to Boom. Okay, what page is that on? Uh, I ha- I want to mention something on page 290. Okay, I don't have anything till 311, so go ahead. Okay, so just real quick, uh, I don't know if you uh, were familiar with the first Wilds N narrative arc, but now we have a new one, uh, issue number one of six, Wilds N, The Enemy Within. This is written by Dan Abnett with art by Ian Culbert, so that's something I think to look forward to. And you can also get the first volume of Wilds End uh, which is on the next page so you can, you can keep up with that and then the other thing I wanted to mention in the boom section is on page 296 and this is I guess kind of a big deal and they're making a really big deal out of this this is Peanuts a tribute to Charles M. Schultz so this has contributions from a wide variety of creators Art Balthazar, Mike Allred, mm. uh, Colleen Coover, Roger Langridge, Jeff Lemire, Terry Moore, Dust- Dustin Gwynn, Paul Pope, on and on and on. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. Mm-hmm. Um, Peanuts is one of those one of those books. I don't know, like, for example, have you seen the um, the previews for the CGI Peanuts movie that's coming out? No. It, it it freaks me out in the kind of uncanny valley way. And the cover of this has, you know, a Schultz drawing of um, Charlie Brown and then a more realistic drawing of Charlie Brown. And for some reason with, um, you know, I or I guess, I mean, the, for some reason, I think the reason is probably pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, I associate Peanuts so much with Schultz's style. And when the characters are drawn not in his style, I find it off-putting. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people do love Peanuts and love Schultz's work. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely have strong feelings about it, but I don't know about um, seeing too many other people draw in the peanut style, like they, they show a picture of Jeff Lemire's version of, of Charlie Brown and Snoopy. And that's a little odd. Yeah. He looks like a Holocaust victim. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, that's, that's, that's a world of peanuts. That's a peanuts crossover that shouldn't exist. Yeah. See, I'm, I don't have a problem with the illustrated tribute like this, mm-hmm. but the, you know, an animated version of Charlie Brown, and I have not seen you know what you just mentioned. I would have a problem with that, and I guess it would be similar to the, you know, the reasons why a couple of years ago I refused to see the Sherman and Mr. Peabody movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very similar thing. Mm. So you say you go where to next? Uh, page 311. Ah, me too. Yeah, and uh, you're probably going for the broadsword comics on that page, <laughs> but I am I am going for what's below the broadsword. And, and you know, whatever people feel, you know, Holly, Holly and well, uh, Jim have been nice to us. But, um, right. But I, I like the way you put it, below the broadsword. Yeah. So there's there's something rather phallic about that. <laughs> under, under Candlewick Press uh, is another graphic memoir. So this mm-hmm. this one looks – and this one looks interesting. Honor Girl uh, by Maggie Thrash. And uh, I think this is um, – is this May, Maggie Thrash's first work? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I, I assume so. I, I don't know who. I, I haven't seen mm-hmm. her before. Uh, but it says, all girl camp, first love, first heartbreak, at once romantic and devastating, brutally honest and full of humor. This graphic novel memoir is, yeah, is a debut debut of the rare yeah. rare sort. Maggie Thrash has spent basically every summer of her 15-year-old life 
at Camp Bellflower for girls deep in the heart of Appalachia. She uh, She's from Atlanta. She's never kissed a guy. She's into Backstreet Boys in a really deep way, and her long summer days are full of pleasant, peaceful nothing until one confounding moment. A split second of innocent physical contact pulls Maggie into a... a uh, a gut-twisting love for an older, wiser, and, and was surprising of all, at least to Maggie, female counselor named Aaron. So, um, anyway, that's that sounds like a fascinating memoir, and so I'm really looking forward to checking that out. And you know, maybe if that comes out at the same time as um, um, the story of my tits, we could maybe do both of those together on an episode yeah it'd be like a semi-themed show I, yeah. i'd like something like that yeah. uh and i think that you know it's this this is also something that i noted you know not the broadsword that's solicited above <laughs> but yeah i mean it looks interesting and uh i mean obviously they had no reason to know this when they solicited but it this solicit comes at a rather timely moment in our country's history with the supreme court ruling from a few days ago mm-hmm. yeah. yes yes so I would like to read this and at the same time and discuss it on the show and at the same time say to Scalia and Alito, bite me. Oh, all all of them. Uh, Clarence Thomas's response was particularly horrifying. Yeah. So yeah, all those guys. Um, on the next page, I wanted to mention just briefly that under Canton Street Press, you can find. A solicit for the complete Golden Age Airboy and Valkyrie. And I mention this in light of the recent number one issue of Airboy from Image. Mm -hmm. James Robinson and Greg. Um, well, who's the artist? I don't. I don't have the book in front. I can't of me. remember. But uh, that, that that was a fun first issue. We were talking about that at Heroes Con. Mm -hmm. So if you enjoyed that, but you don't know the, I guess the. Uh, the Golden Age reference to Airboy, you can get your fix on that mm -hmm. from the complete Golden Age Airboy in Valkyrie. Mm -hmm. So, where do you go after that? Uh, I go to um, to Dynamite. So I don't know if you and that's page three twenty. So I don't know if you have anything before then. Yeah, uh, before that is on page three sixteen under Conundrum Press. The Dharma Punks. This is one that I'm really looking forward to. This is one going to be one of their fall releases. Mm. It says, set over one long night in Auckland, New Zealand in 1994, a group of anarchist punks have hatched a plan to sabotage the opening of a multinational fast food restaurant by blowing it sky high come opening day. Chopstick, and I guess that's a character in the book, has been given the unenviable task of setting the bomb before the opening, but the night takes many unexpected turns. Chance encounters and events from his past conspire against him, forcing Chopstick to deal with the more to deal with more than just the mission at hand. Chopstick's journey is a meditation on life, love, friendship, and the ghost of Kurt Cobain. Okay. So that sounds interesting. Plus there's an introduction by another New Zealander, Dylan Horrocks. Yeah, that 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 should be interesting. Um, yeah, and and I but, love Conundrum Press books. Mm -hmm. And since we're on that page, just a quick mention over to the left is the second omnibus volume of Comic Mix's John Sable Freelance reprints. And John Sable Freelance is one of my top ten all-time favorite comic series. Didn't you mention that last? Oh, um, I, I will always. Show you were I will on? always do that. Yeah. Okay, so what do you have in Dynamite? Um, I again just just to kind of mention really quickly that uh, um, that Dynamite has the Alice Cooper license, and so friend of the show Tim Seeley is going to be writing the Alice Cooper miniseries, Alice Cooper versus Chaos. So it's Alice Cooper <laughs> incorporated into the Chaos universe, and uh, he's doing that with Jim Terry who is uh, the artist on Sundowners. So those two are continuing to, to collaborate. And, uh, I, and I know from talking to Tim, I actually have talked to Tim about this series. They're ha he's having fun with it. Well, cool. Well, this is the second time that Tim has come up in this episode. Yeah. Well, there you Justly go. so. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that's so, uh, 
I don't have anything for until 334, so if you have anything else in Dynamite or before then. I go to the same place. Now, this again may be a part of me missing some episodes, but and, and I just mentioned John Sable Freelance, which was published by the original first comics. So Devil's Due has, seems to have revived the first comics label or trademark or imprint or whatever we want to call it. Right. Um, yet, really, other than the E-Man book, E-Man the Early Years uh, by Nick, uh, Nick uh, Cuddy and Joe Statton, um, th- there's not a not a lot of connection between these books and the original first comics line. And by the way, E-Man, I really, I, uh, was, was one of my uh, one of the series I love. A really, really fun superhero series from back in the seventies. But, um, but really, nothing, nothing here really speaks to me of the kind of books that first comics did back in the eighties, like, like John Sable or American Flag. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Warp, Mars, um, Grim Jack, Star Slayer, all those. Uh, I don't, I don't see a connection here, so I'm not sure how how first comics factors into this um, publishing venture. Yeah, well, it could be that they're just bringing back first comics, the name of first comics, and then going from there. It's not like they necessarily, you know, outside of E-Man, have to to link that. Uh, overtly to the past. I mean, I think that, that, that it's good that there's that link. But, uh, for instance, two of the other things that are solicited on the same page from Devil's Due slash First Comics, they do seem interesting. The uh, uh, the fill box, Matthew and Sean's uh, fill boxes, Cadaver Dogs of Winter, a graphic novel, that, that, that seems interesting. And I'm particularly interested in issue number one of Public Relations, uh, written by Matthew Sturges and Dave Justice with art by David Hahn. So, um... And I think this is new. You, you would ask if mm-hmm. you were you weren't aware of this because you haven't been a part of the past two preview shows. Yeah. Uh, because on the following page it says introducing Devil's Due first comics, and so I guess they're just announcing this. Yeah. It is kind of a big to do. They have several page mm-hmm. pages here. Yeah, giving but, us sample. Right, right. And it, but again, you know, and and I think that 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 public relations book looks interesting because I like both. I like Matt Sturgis. As a writer, we talked about him earlier, mm-hmm. and I like David Hahn's art. Uh, again, though, you know, why why call it first comics? Why bring back first comics if it, it's not going to even seem to have the spirit of the original first comics publishing? You know, okay. I mean, why you, good- you know the, you could you could just as well bring back Eclipse or Pacific Comics. And just throw out anything, you know. But uh, uh, you know, and, and looking at the um, the list of creators that are going to be uh, involved in this, um, there are a couple listed here who were involved in the original first comics: Mike Barron and um, Max Allen Collins. Uh, Max Allen Collins only did a few things for first, but Mike Barron did. Many things, including one of my other top ten favorite comics of all time, Nexus, and uh, and Badger. So uh, I'll I'll be curious to see. You know, I I I had read a press release about this merger or whatever you want to call it uh, earlier, and got kind of interested in it because I was a huge fan of first comics back in the '80s, um, and so I'm I'm wondering. Again, as I said, I'm just just wondering how uh, how much maybe my nostalgia will be satisfied. Maybe that's the way to approach it. Will my yeah. nostalgia be satisfied by this emerging, or is it just going to be another another brand? I guess we'll see in the coming months. Yep. Now, under this list of creators, they also have listed Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor. So mm-hmm. apparently, they can do more than just DC stuff. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we'll 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 see what comes out from this. But but uh, yeah, that um, public relations does look at, like an interesting. 
and we get a few page, a couple pages of uh, preview text. Um, mm-hmm. uh, that looks interesting. Uh, I don't have anything until Droning Quarterly on three forty six. Yeah, me too. So, so you're going to mention Step Aside Pops, a Hark, a Vagrant collection. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably the highlight of this. If I would pick one thing out of this previews that I'm most looking forward to, it's a new Kate Beaton Hark of Vagrant collection. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like uh, Kate Beaton's work. Uh, and in fact, they do have the first book, Hark of Vagrant, uh, resolicited. In fact, it's a new printing uh, on that same page. So if you don't know what we're referring to, then if you turn to page 346 of the previews catalog, July you'll find a Kate Beaton smorgasbord. Yeah, and Hart, when the first Hark of Agrant book uh, collection came out, it was it made a lot of people's top ten lists for that year. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, I fully expect uh, Step Aside Pops to be, uh, to be up there as well because Kate Beaton's work is, is always solid. Yeah, did you get... Any uh, free comic book day books, uh, particularly the one from Drawn and Quarterly or one of the ones from Drawn and Quarterly? No, I didn't. I don't think I did. Because that had uh, selections from Step Aside. Oh, books. good. Yeah. Hmm. So as well as uh, from another book that's solicited on that following page, and that is uh, Julian Tamaki's Super Mutant Magic Academy. But hmm. that's that's an older solicit. It's a resolicit. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, we usually make a easy transition from Drawn in Quarterly to Fantagraphics, but there are a couple things before we get to Fantagraphics that I have. I don't know if you have anything. I just have First, Second, which is before Fantagraphics in this. Yeah. Well, right before First, Second, there is a new book coming out from Eureka Productions. Now, if you listen to the podcast, you know that, um, you know, we mention new books in the graphic classic series and I, I particularly like them because uh, I like comics and adaptation but it's not often that you get something from Eureka Productions which is primarily the graphic classic series but their next volume which is 26 is Vampire Classics and so if there is a classic narrative that has a vampire chances are it's going to be collected here so you're going to find an adaptation of Nosferatu Ray Bradbury's The Man Upstairs, um, H.G. Wells's The Strange Orchid, Robert Lewin Stevenson's Oala, Olala. Uh-huh. So, and, and they do really good work. And I, I've mentioned this several times before on the podcast that one of the things I love about graphic classics is that the artists that Tom Pomplin gets to do the adaptations many times do very creative and unconventional things with the original. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I mean, I appreciate fidelity, but I also appreciate uh, a lot of liberty <laughs> that people can take yeah. uh, in doing things that are unusual. So yeah, yeah. There's I I I appreciate uh, artists do, and writers doing something creative with adaptations that make it. You answer the question: Why am I reading this as a comic instead of as a, a book or as prose? Right? Exactly. Right, and I think that the graphic classic series very often does feature some really nice adaptations that work in that way. Mm-hmm. So, first, second. Yes. Speaking of adaptations. Uh huh. Well, the the I only I only have one thing in first second. So, if you're gonna go ahead with um, other stuff, then. Well, the first second one I was going to mention is Fable Comics. mm Hmm. Which is on page 353. Were you going to mention another one? Yes. Which one? Uh, Secret Coders. Oh, okay. So go ahead with Fable Comics and Seconds. No, I, ju- that no, comes I, just, first. Wanted, I, I, well, I just wanted to mention that. Okay. So this is this, this is part of the series, right? Or sort of semi-series that they've done. Because they have fairy tale comics. And then nursery rhyme comics. And nursery rhyme yeah. comics. And... Um, so I'm curious. They don't, they only list um, Graham Annable as as one of the creators, but I know Fairy Tale Comics has an all star cast of creators. One of which is Jean Louis Yang. Yeah, and so I was I'm I'm 
curious to see who they who Chris editor Chris Duffy got to uh, to help adapt the Fable comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, then on on page um, three fifty four, the next page is Secret Coders Volume One. So this is part of a new series that. Uh, for a second is putting out written by Gene Wen Yang and drawn by Mike Holmes um, and the solicit says welcome to Stately Academy a school which is just crawling with mysteries to be solved the founder of the school left many clues and puzzles to challenge his enterprising students using their wits and their growing prowess with coding Hopper and her friend uh, any are going to solve the mystery of Stately Academy no matter what it takes. Um, so this this is certified kid friendly mm-hmm. by uh, by Di- uh, by Diamond, but I would uh, you know I think Gene Yang is is a really good creator at at doing both. You know, getting aiming at a younger audience, but having something in there for older audiences as well. Um, and this this looks like it is it'll be a lot of fun. And so uh, anytime there's new Gene Yang work, I'm excited. But uh, this this looks particularly interesting. Yeah, and I'm I'm looking forward to this. So I guess in between his work on you know doing Superman stories, he's going to be coming out with Secret Coder stories. Yeah, which he's just writing. Uh, yeah, and so and Mike Holmes is drawing. But I think it'll be yeah it'll be interesting. It'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, another first second book uh, that's on that same page, uh, and the solicit is right above that, is Ben Hatke's Little Robot. Um, I probably won't get it, but it's worth mentioning because almost exactly a year ago, I think a tad more than a year ago, uh, Wolverton and I had Hatke on for an interview, mm. and we were talking with him about his Zeta stories. In fact, those three Zeta books are solicited or resolicited on that same page, and he had mentioned that his next project was something more like a children's book, and what he was referring to, I'm assuming, is Little Robot. Mm. Yeah. And then we get to Fanagraphics, always one of our favorites. Yep. So which one stands out for you? Um, I don't know. Which there's, ones? There's, not a, there's not actually, to tell you the truth, there's not a lot in here that jumped out at me for Fanagraphics. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's more stuff that they've, they've been doing regularly. You know, the, their EC... Collections, their uh, Steve Ditko archives, the continuation of Hip Hop Family Tree as a monthly comic, uh, their Walt Disney books. So um, that's you know, there a lot of this is more of the uh, more of the stuff they do well. Yeah, yeah. I guess what what um, stands out for me is the the next volume of the Ditko archives, but also Terror Assaulter. O-M-W-O-T by Benjamin Mara, and I'm not familiar mm. with this, but it looks good. Yeah, it, it's... I'm familiar with Mara's work. Yeah, it's satirizing the war on terror, which is, you know, a pretty easy target for right. satire, and one that... One that... One that's... There, there's not a paucity of work doing that, so... Yeah. Um, but then on that following page, on 357, there is Lib Subur- Liz Suburbia's Sacred Heart, which also looks good. This is, this is a, another debut. We've talked about a number uh-huh. of debuts as well. This is a debut coming-of-age graphic novel filled with teen loves and fights and parties. Mm-hmm. But, I, I, but I think this is not a memoir. So, no. Uh, so, but that, uh, could that, be, looks- that could be worth pairing with Honor Girl, too, because they're both coming-of-age stories. Yeah, there you go. Boy, there are a lot of possibilities here for future shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, where do you go after Fantagraphics? I, I jump ahead to 370. So, okay. Um, on 368, I have just uh, let me see. That's Harper Collins. Let me get there. Mm-hmm. And that is, uh, I guess, a comics version of Gaiman's Graveyard Book. Mm-hmm. And this is illustrated by P. Craig Russell and, and various. But if it if, if you got P. Craig Russell involved, you know uh-huh. it's going to be good stuff. So, I mean, I, I have not read uh, his, you know, 
the graveyard book for you know younger readers, but now we have a comics version of it, both volumes one and two. So mm-hmm. there's that. And and, and you, Craig, Craig Russell does uh, the adaptation, but other artists are involved as well. So Kev, right. Kevin Nolan, Tony Harris, Scott Hampton, Jill Thompson, David Lafuente, uh, and so on. So yeah, there could be that. Those those could be interesting. I did, I don't yeah. know if those are new or not. That's what I that I kind of skipped over those because I oh, okay I, I I couldn't remember if they were new. Uh, so on on three seventy, where do you go? Just just the one thing, which is the uh, that you know under Houghton Mifflin Harcourt announces the solicitation for the Best American Comics two thousand fifteen. We don't have a cover. We don't have any anything about the content, but we we will definitely be talking about that. I assume. Oh, yeah, and I think we should do what we said we were going to do last year, and that is uh, in in, in almost preparation for our show on Best American Comics, which we do as our penultimate Mm -hmm. episode of the year, is to uh, have the editor back on. Oh, yeah. I would love to have Bill on again. Yeah, that was a a fun interview, and I like talking to Bill in general. So, yeah. So another thing to look forward to. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're right. There, there's no cover, but I guess they had to get it in because that's coming out pretty soon. Yeah, that's true. September. Yeah, September or October, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the last two books that we referenced were from major trade publishers. There was Harper Collins and the Graveyard Book, then Houghton Mifflin Harcourt with Best American Comics, and then if you look on three seventy three, mm-hmm. you have Knopf with Ann Tenna. You know, you mentioned earlier Cancer Vic- uh, Vixen. Yeah. But yeah, this is by the same author, uh, Mars- uh, Marsa. Uh, Echocella Mark Marchetto. and I butchered that name completely. Mm-hmm. But yeah, this is this is another one. Now, you know, I got maybe about two, maybe three months ago. I got a galley of this. Did you? No. Huh? Man, and I would have been I, all over that. And I didn't know. I assume you got one as well. I didn't know that I was on Knopf's review list to where I get galleys. Mm-hmm. Or but yeah so and, and again it's like a lot of comics galleys which I I wonder about the the logic of sending out galleys like that uncorrected proofs whatever you mm-hmm. want to call them because they're not chances are they're not going to be in color yeah. and that really takes away from books that do appear in color but still so this looks good as well yeah yeah and so just a quick uh, mention of the the solicit which is you know cancer vixen is a um, is her memoir. Uh, mm-hmm. Marchetto's memoir, whereas this is her first work of fiction, uh, the story of an influential gossip columnist brought face to face with her higher self and a challenge to change her her life for the better. And the the solicit is actually pretty long, so I'm not going to go into all of it. But um, that that sounds interesting. And in Marchetto, I, I'm curious to see. Uh, if, if Marchetto's style, her art style, is any different in this than than it was in Cancer Vixen, because I think that um, her style in Cancer Vixen is real is really interesting, mm-hmm. um, and very very kind of simplistic, and not I don't mean that as a pejorative. It's it's it f- fits that uh, subject matter in the story that she's trying to tell really well. So right. I'm curious. Kind of a strip down. Yeah, yeah, so I'm curious to see what she does in this. Me too. Uh, I go next to 376. Yeah. Koyama. Mm hmm. Yeah. And we have actually two solicits from work, or on work by Mike DeForge. So there's issue number seven of Loose, so there's that. And, and then there's another collection, I guess, that's going to be similar to Very Casual from a couple of years ago, and this one is Dressing. Yeah. So this is uh, various odds and ends, uh, strange stories of his. But uh, actually, strange stories is 
probably redundant when you when you're talking about Michael DeForge. He he's a very different kind of comics artist, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I mean I, I I enjoy his work, so I think it's great to have both of these. But there's the other solicit here as well. Uh, Black Rat from Cole Closser. Are you familiar with Cole Closser? No, I'm not either. Mm-hmm. It says a aesthetically varied collection of nine graphic short stories and loosely loosely linked by the recurring appearance of a black rat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, getting that that looks interesting. Getting back to DeForge for a minute, you know, I am looking forward to those those works as well. And I think this DeForge is, you know, probably the best right now at doing that kind of independent comic. That's mm-hmm. the kind of wildly imaginative, uh, unique to his style, world world building that he does, um, but also making him really really fun and often hilarious. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to both dressing and lose. Yeah, and in fact, I would I would like to get Michael DeForge on the show, and I have um, actually tried to see, going through the publicist of Koyama, Ed, to see if DeForge would be interested, and at least on the first attempt, there was a no thank you. Mm. Okay. Maybe someday, though. Maybe. But we can enjoy his comics in the meantime. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know where you go next. I go to 393. Okay, yeah, we're coming to the end of the catalog, Mm. what we usually mention. Um, Real quick, on page 378, there is Shaman Volume 1, and I mention this because this is from Locust Moon Press, and the only other thing from Locust Moon that I'm aware of is that really, from what I've heard, very nice, large size uh, tribute to Little Nemo Mm. that came out last year, and Locust Moon is kind of like Bergen Street Press, right? It's a bookstore, but they have just started to publish their own books so now they're venturing into i guess this is a work of fiction so maybe we can expect to see more in the months to come from locust moon yeah and then on 381 in the oni section we have a 10th anniversary edition of elk's run and i mentioned that uh, because this is another one of those books. If you weren't familiar with uh, Josh Fialkov's Elk's Run from 10 years ago, now's the time to, to really get in on it because this is an anniversary edition. And also we had Fialkov on the show along with uh, Chamberlain um, uh, about two months ago, I guess it was, to talk about punks. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had mentioned Elk's Run. So there you go. Good. And so, anyway, you say you go where now? To uh, 393. 393. Okay, I think I may know what you're going to reference. Um, maybe you do, and maybe, maybe. you don't. Well, let's see. <laughs> I went to talk, This is under uh, Scout Comics. Yep. Hench Girl Number 1 by Kristen Gudsnook. Yes. Um, and uh, this is... Uh, the solicit, I, the solicit really caught my eye, and I, I feel like I've heard about this book elsewhere, and I can't remember where. Um, but anyway, Mary Posa hates her job. She works long hours for little pay, no insurance, and worst of all, no respect. Her coworkers are jerks, and her boss doesn't appreciate her. He's also he also happens to be a supervillain. Cursed with a conscience, Mary would give anything to be something other than a hench girl. I like that idea. Okay. I think you've just given yourself away. You do not listen to the webcomic episodes that Wolverton and I do, do you? I don't I I'm not giving anything away. I don't listen to any I like I told you I tried to listen to your last previews episode. Got I got I think 12 hours in and I had to stop because I couldn't keep going. So, okay. yeah, no, I don't listen to anything that I'm not on. Are yeah. you kidding me? Uh, I mentioned this because <laughs> A few months ago, we discussed Hench Girl. So it is a webcomic. Yes, it's a webcomic. Now, I did not know until looking at this previews that it was coming out from Scout Comics, and I, I wasn't aware of Scout Comics before. Mm-hmm. But yeah. uh, it, it, it's, maybe it's that's a good where comic. I had heard of it then that I kind of saw that you guys did the webcomic show. 
Yeah, and it's good. We both liked it. So this, this makes sense that something that good should now come out in hard copy. Well, good for you. Now I don't have to listen to that episode because you just sum- <laughs> summarized it for me. Yeah. So that's, that's you know, 16 hours of my life I don't have to spend listening to that episode. Exactly. Aren't you happy? <laughs> the, the episodes I'm not on are going to get longer and longer every time. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking advantage of the time away. <laughs> Uh, now, a couple uh, – Self-Made Heroes also solicited on page 393, and there's the fourth volume of AMA. Uh, but I think what I'm even more excited about is Ruins by Peter Cooper. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, you and I have talked a number of times about how much we like Cooper's work, so mm-hmm. so now I, I didn't even know he was coming out with it. Well, actually, I did the other day because I got a catalog from – Abrams and it included that that I've yeah. forgotten. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably one of the other big highlights of this this catalog for me is new Peter Cooper work. Um, yeah, and the the you know the third volume of Ama just came out right right recently, and so this is the fourth and final volume of Ama. So um, we'll see how that goes. And then uh, I, I wanted to mention too on on page three ninety three the Secret Acres book, uh, Pale Fire graphic novel by M K Reed and Farrell Dalrymple. Since mm-hmm. Farrell Dalrymple is another a creator, we often come back to, and um, I'm I'm curious about that book too. Yeah. Now, when I first saw that title, I wondered if this was some kind of adaptation of Nabokov, but yeah. it's not. It's one. Yeah, it's one word to one make word. make that distinction. Maybe I don't know, uh, but um, yeah. So, and it, and it, this seems to be more uh, more kind of grounded in realism than we often see from Dalrymple. Right. Uh, it's. Um, you know, everyone hates Dwayne the Firebug. The bad boy trouble follows. Him. Uh, the bad boy trouble follows him everywhere. The bad boy trouble follows everywhere. And then Holly finds a warmth to Dwayne, a spark everyone's missing. Holly knows that she's doing what she's doing, but after tonight's fireworks, she'll find out who knows best. Can Holly play with fire without getting burned? So anyway, so yeah. It's, you read that well. Thanks. No, I didn't. I had to read three sen- two sentences more than <laughs> once. Uh, anyway, the last part of it. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, good. So anyway, yeah. yeah so that's that's interesting. And again, yet another coming of age story. Yeah. Wow. We may, we may have a themed episode after all. Yeah. Uh, but that's all I have in the catalog. So if you have anything after yeah. that. No, the only other thing that I have in the regular comic section is on page 414, and that's, again, another major trade publisher, Touchstone, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. Uh And that is amazing, fantastic, incredible, a marvelous memoir. And whose memoir is it? Stanley's. And I mention this not because I'm going to get it, because I'm not, but... There are some good names here. So this is written by Stan Lee and Peter David, and Colleen Doran does the art. And I, you know, I love Doran's art. Yeah. So for for those reasons, I think it would be worth getting. But I'll have to be honest with you. And I was thinking about this after coming back from Heroes Con. I, I'm getting mainstream fatigue, and to me. It, I think Marvel, even though he's not been with Marvel for, for years, Marvel is part and parcel of what Stan Lee is about. Mm. Uh, you know, you see him all the time. You see him referenced. You see all of these references to him in, in, in a variety of, of, of pop culture venues. I just get tired of that, just as I get tired of Marvel doing what Marvel does and also DC doing what DC does. Mm. So I, I reference this because it is kind of an event, I guess, in, in this catalog. It's something worth noting. And in fact, they're listing this as a featured item, the editors of previews. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to get it. I don't have much of a problem with Marvel and DC right now. I'm kind of enjoying a lot of books that they're putting out. But um, but with you know Heroes Con, you know Stan Lee being at Heroes Con and seeing you know what you had to pay yeah. in order to get in involved with that at all, uh, hundred hundred dollars or more 
to just to get one book signed, five hundred dollars, got you a cocktail party with Stan and uh, a picture with him or whatever. Um, you know, that's you know, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and right. um and you know, this the fact that this book not only comes in the, the thirty dollar hardcover edition, but also in the hundred dollar slipcase edition and the two hundred and fifty dollar signed slipcase edition is just yet another you know, another money grab for Stan in his waning years. Yep. But um but on top of that, uh you know I Stan's own version of his own life story and his own the credit he gives himself for his creations uh, for the level of involvement he had in the creations he is connected to is um, you know has often been challenged or even debunked by others. Right. So um, I also wonder how much of a, a memoir of Stan Lee's is is going to be trustworthy and worthwhile exactly again another reason why i tire of stan lee and, and i want to make it clear because i said earlier that I, I i'm getting really tired of dc and especially marvel right now before our listeners you know contact us and say you know you bastards you know you elitist you you don't you know talk about the mainstream you don't understand you know andy and i point out almost every episode that we like the superhero stuff we just choose not to talk about it on this podcast but also by what I meant by being tired of DC and especially Marvel, it's not so much the content, mm-hmm. you know, what the, the the actual stories they come out with. It's the basically the marketing arm of DC and especially Marvel because, uh, you know, all the shenanigans they pull, multiple number ones, uh, price increases, you know, a, a gazillion different variant covers, uh, you know, changing the the universes, starting over. You know, one crisis, one event after another, it it becomes exhausting. It's like, okay, just tell good stories, but get the marketing people out of it. That's what I have a problem with. Mm-hmm. Okay. For the record. Okay. Yeah. Do you have anything else? The only other thing I have is in the book section. This is on 451. And I was not aware of this. Apparently, this came out in April. It is... Class, please open your comics. Essays on teaching. I was not aware of this, but I know it's a McFarland book. Or do, do you know about this? No. Okay. I, I just wanted to ask if you knew about it. Yeah. It's edited by Matthew L. Miller. And I don't know anybody who's in it. That I mean, I, it doesn't list anybody who's in it, so I don't know. No. So, but other than that, that's all I have for the July previews. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I didn't have. I thought I didn't have much for this previews, and yet still, this episode is going to be about as long as your last previews episode that I wasn't on. I know, so it all comes back to bite you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I should. Yeah, it's just like it's karma. I guess I should just watch, watch, you know, my mouth. Yeah, Andy learns a lesson. Yeah, that'll be the that'll be the title of this episode. <laughs> Andy oh, shoot well, No, but no, I'm never gonna learn a lesson about shooting my big mouth off. That's always <laughs> gonna be my downfall. So anyway, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, yeah, th- there's a lot that we discussed on this episode, whether you know we planned it that way or not, but we, we talked about it a lot. And if listeners want to pre-order any of the titles that we have been discussing on this show, they can do so by going to the website of our sponsor, and that's Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to dcbservice.com, you'll find an incredible selection. It is the place to get your comics. And after you do pre-order your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know the kind of things that you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find on the right-hand side of your browser a little tab that says Send Voicemail. Click on that, and from the comfort of your own browser or mobile device, you can send us a message through the wonders of SpeakPipe. It's very, very easy. 
or if you want to be more difficult about things, you can call us on the phone. Our phone number is 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right. Or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can get a hold of us, or you can find us on Twitter, uh, where we announce new content to the podcast, as well as updates to the blog. You can check out our Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. We're also on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Instagram, and on Google+. We also have a YouTube channel, so you can consume our podcast that way. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, and when you do, please leave us a rating and review. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, and you can find every single one of our episodes as well as our reviews and comics-related commentary that we put up on our blog, and that's at comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us, find out what we're doing, and let us know how we're doing. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, as we said at the top of the show when we announced various emails and Facebook postings that we got, we do appreciate getting in touch. So, you know, again, thank you to Tristan, Matthew, Carlos, and Jordan. We appreciate you guys getting in touch. Yes, thanks. So let us hear from you. And until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya. some ham.